Well, hello. My name is Dr. Ali Baumgartner, and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. And though my day job is taking care of fossil animals, today I'm going to be talking to you about something a little bit closer to my heart, plants. Specifically, today we're going to be talking about phenology. And technically, that doesn't just include plants, but that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So phenology is the study of when biological events happen. So just the timing of biological events. So this can be things like when birds migrate, when flowers bloom, when leaves fall, things that happen every year predictably. And that's all that phenology is. And people have been studying this for a very, very long time. And normally when we talk about phenology, we're talking about it in a temperate setting. So like here in temperate North America or in say Europe. So I'm gonna be focusing on that. And because right now it is spring in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm also mostly going to be uh, focusing on spring phenology. Though there are things that happen again in the fall. So I'm gonna give you a couple of exciting examples. And this is something that people have been studying for a very long time and even just aware of for a very long time. If you've ever talked to a farmer, they will definitely tell you that things aren't how they used to be. We used to plant things at a different time. The birds used to come back at a different time. And that's just phenology. So the first thing I'm gonna be talking about are spring ephemerals. So ephemerals are types of plants often flowers, that are small and weedy, and they live their entire life cycle in less than a growing season, in less than a single season. So these very sad tulips are an example of a possible spring ephemeral. There's something that grows very quickly, and then, as you can see, will die very quickly. Um, so the reason they're called ephemerals, like I said, is because they live in this very short window of time. In the spring, the limiting factor for these spring ephemerals is they have to be able to grow, bloom, and reproduce before the um, tree cover comes in and the canopy cover gets all rid of all of their life, <laughs> their light also their life, let's be real. So an example of this could be tulips or daffodils, but if you think of native plants, that's going to be um, uh, snowdrops, Virginia bluebells, uh, spring beauty, things like that. And there aren't just spring ephemerals, those are probably the ones that most people are most familiar with, but there are other examples such as mudflat ephemerals, which are plants that only live once the water level goes down enough uh, in a body of water for there to be mud for them to grow in. And another common example are desert ephemerals. If you've ever heard of a super bloom, that's when these de desert flowers have uh, cool enough temper temperatures, enough um, water as well as low winds for all of these flowers to come out of the woodwork and bloom all together. So some examples of that may be um, pincushions or sand verbena. So in addition to the spring eph ephemerals, a lot of trees also make flowers and they might not be the kind of flowers that you may be thinking of. And the timing of when trees flower versus when trees flush or grow their leaves is really important. So the timing of this is related to the temperature. So some trees will flower before they leaf and some trees will leaf before they flower. And the reason for this is just because of how they get pollinated. So plants, in uh, temperate regions, deciduous plants, once they drop their leaves, they cannot make energy. Plants make energy through photosynthesis in their leaves. So as soon as these trees drop their leaves in the fall, they're done making energy until it warms up enough for them to bring their, tr their leaves back in the spring. And so it's this fine line you want to make, if you are a tree, you want to make sure you have leaves for as long as you possibly can so you can be making energy, but you need to make sure that you're not putting your leaves in danger of, say, frost. But the other important thing for plants is not just energy, but reproduction. In order to reproduce, plants like uh, angiosperms, flowering plants, have to make flowers. And so those are the two things that are competing with each other. 
for trees that are pollinated by wind, if they have leaves in the way, the wind won't be able to go through the branches and they won't be able to disperse their pollen and reproduce. And that's bad. <laughs> so if a tree is wind pollinated, it will flower first before the, the, the uh, leaves are in the way and then it will leaf after that. If it is a plant that is pollinated by insects, then you might put a little bit more energy into making your flowers. And it doesn't matter so much if the leaves are on the tree because insects can, insects can navigate through some leaves. That's not a big deal. And so they will leaf a little bit earlier so they can begin that process of photosynthesis, begin making energy, because they're going to need to put a little bit more effort into these flowers if they want to attract some insects to pollinate them. There's also um, phenology tied to when plants will drop their leaves. That's called senescence. And for deciduous trees, when they flush and flower and when they drop their leaves, it's kind of the cornerstone of plant phenology. And while I've spent a lot of time talking about plants, yes, there are other things. There are some animals that are involved in uh, phenology studies, specifically amphibians. So if you think of the spring, you know it's spring when you can hear the frogs singing again. And that's true, that is a, a sign of spring, and we can predict when that will happen. So for amphibians such as frogs or salamanders, the adults will lay their eggs in the fall um, in what will become a vernal pool. So over the winter, they will be covered in snow, and once that snow melts in the spring, then you will have these pools form, and that's when the, the eggs will hatch. And once it becomes a little bit warmer and you begin to have spring rains, that's when the frogs and uh, salamanders will begin to explore, begin to breed, and that's when you can hear them. And that is something that you can predict. I know of many herpetologists who get very excited when it finally gets above freezing and starts to rain in the spring because that means they can go rescue some salamanders. And for many people, the most obvious sign of spring and fall are bird migrations. This is very common, particularly through the Great Plains and into the Great Lakes. You can predict when these migrations will happen every year because of changes in temperature or day length. And in general, temperature and day length are the two drivers of when uh, phenological events will happen. If you think about the way that uh, day length works, it's very predictable, right? You have the vernal equinox. In the spring, the days and nights are the same length. And then as you go through the summer, the days get longer and longer until the summer solstice, when you have the longest day of the year. You continue on to the autumnal equinox, when the days are the same length. And then you will continue on to the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. And this is very predictable and doesn't really change that much. Unfortunately, temperature is much more variable. So if you have things that are driven by changes in temperature, well, temperatures are getting warmer. So things are happening sooner than they used to in the past. But anything that's driven by day length may not be as influenced by these changes. And this is, called, uh, this is something that's called uh, season creep. So the fact that if you've talked to farmers, people will tell you they're planting earlier than they used to. You know, they're, they're, the days are, you have more days where you can do things. Then there have been studies in Europe showing that in the past 50 years, spring is almost a week longer than it used to be. We are having increases in uh, growing seasons on both sides. Spring is starting earlier and fall is leaving later. In fact, there are some uh, species that because of changing temperatures, they don't have to migrate anymore. The reason that they would migrate from place to place is in order to maintain a constant comfortable temperature, but they don't have to do that. And that leads to something called phenological mismatch. So that is when you have, say, an organism whose um, phenological events are controlled by light, or someone who, I say someone, uh, another organism whose um, 
phenological events are controlled by temperature. Those things aren't going to be changing at the same rate. So you could lead to instances where you once had a flower and a pollinator that would be in the same place at the same time, but suddenly things change and they don't have that anymore. And this is something that is very worrying and a lot of people are studying. So it's very fun to look at all of these changes of spring, but we need to be aware that not all of these changes are good. So sorry to end on a downer note like that. Look at my pretty tulips and thanks again for letting me talk to you about plants. Until next time. Thanks for joining us in A New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.